Right now, it's time for my favorite part of the week. Yes, uh, there's no doubt about it. If you know me, you know that uh, 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 food is an important part of my life. And also, uh, the suggestions and information we get from our next show host, which is Arthur Schwartz, the food maven. Good morning, Arthur. Good morning, and uh, I hope all is well with everybody. Here It's going to be like spring today in Brooklyn. I'm looking forward. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, we still have we still have uh, uh, fall leaves clinging to the trees. It's been so warm that here we are in the middle of December, and it looks like it's before Thanksgiving. But moving on, <laughs> the weather uh, may contribute to my various food uh, cravings. But a few weeks ago. I was craving, when, when the weather started breaking finally, and it was in the 50s, I started craving a fall treat, a nutmeg cake. And this nutmeg cake has a real good story attached to it. And I d decided to go online to see, uh, you know, because somebody told me that it was Armenian. So I went online. Actually, uh, cut to the chase here, my recipe for this nutmeg cake is all over the Internet. Sometimes I'm credited for it, and I should be because it's got a great story uh, that I can tell attached to it, and sometimes not. And then there's, there's now a rash of recipes called Armenian nutmeg cake, and I don't doubt that this recipe was Ar originally Armenian, but I got it secondhand from Lori Colwyn. Now, Lori Colwyn was, she died very, very young, I have to say, 20 years ago. Um, I'm going to look up the date, actually. But Lori Colwyn was a novelist who also wrote a column for Gourmet magazine. Yes, I'm old enough to remember when Gourmet had a heyday <coughs> in the 80s, I guess. Um, Anyway, Laurie wrote this uh, a very well-read column and that became two books, Home Cooking and More Home Cooking. Now, Laurie lived in Cornwall, and, and I lived in Cornwall, and we had a mutual friend uh, who lived down the road from me, and I heard all about Laurie, that she wanted to meet me, and I wanted to meet her, and... I don't know, somehow this never really happened until the mutual friend's husband opened a new art studio and they had a, a, a studio warming party and uh, Lori was charged with making the dips. And I got to the party and I see this woman standing with a, an enormous pottery, local potter, a pottery a bowl full of hummus and I said, oh, Lori Cohen. And we finally met and bonded immediately. Um, and she made very good hummus. And uh, I don't even remember what all else there was, but it's not important. Uh, so we, we wanted to get together in a more, you know, intimate, so to speak, uh, a situation, not at a big uh, art studio warming. And uh, so we, we called each other, and we had a nice long conversation, and I invited her and her husband and her daughter for dinner, and she said, "Nah, my husband doesn't really like to socialize when he's up here. Why don't we wait till I get back to Manhattan, and we can have lunch? I said, great. And then she died. In her sleep, in her late 40s, um, and we never had the lunch. A few weeks go by, and the mutual friend comes by my house and says, I want you to have something that's from Lori. It's a recipe that she gave me. Now, let me say that our mutual friend, I'm not mentioning her name for discretion here. Our mutual friend did not cook. I mean, she not only did not cook, she would not cook. Uh, she had several children. I'm not sure what they ate, but I know that it was an issue. So, uh, and the husband didn't cook either. Uh, he was an artist. He was in the studio. He was in the, the new studio all the time. Anyway, the mutual friend comes by and she said, "This is a recipe that Lori gave to me because she was so embarrassed for me that I couldn't even bake a cookie for my kids." 
And it's a simple cake recipe. Truth, you know, is I never made it. But she said she would never publish the recipe, that if anybody asked me where the recipe came from, I could say it was an old family recipe. Well, looking at the recipe, which has an inordinate amount of nutmeg, and not only that, but also cinnamon and nutmeg uh, and, and clove, plus the uh, liquid is yogurt. I'm figuring it's somewhere Middle Eastern-ish. So, but it ends up, it's now on the Internet as an Armenian nutmeg cake, and real Armenians are, are, are comment on these cakes. Ah, my grandmother used to make a cake just like this. I'm so happy to have this recipe because it's like my grandma's. Well, if you look online, you'll find out that there are other versions besides Lori Colwyn's version of the nutmeg cake. But I do want to give you Lori's. I made it. Uh, 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 I had some uh, friends in for lunch one day. This, I'm starting to entertain people again a little bit. Um, and, I, and I thought this was something. Uh, listen, I was craving it. I could make all kinds of rationalizations how it fit or didn't fit into the menu. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I wanted <laughs> to eat this. So the only way to eat it was to make it. Uh, it's really interesting cake. It, you, you, you make this the dry mixture. Bakers will know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, you make up the dry mixture and pat half of it, more or less, into the bottom of a springform pan. And when I say pat it, you really are making a bottom crust for a cake that is going to be light. The rest of the, the, the dry, you add the spices, and then you stir in a, an egg and yogurt. And what makes it rise is a little bit of baking soda that go, is the very last thing. Now, baking soda interacts with anything acidic, and you will immediately get a little rise out of it. Uh, baking powder is something different. It has soda in it, but it's called double acting because the second part doesn't happen until it's heated. Anyway, in this case, there's no, it's only baking soda. So here's the the, the, the mixture. Um, by the way, a lot of butter. Very. Good. You don't even have to butter the springform pan, 10-inch springform pan. You could even do it in a 9-inch springform pan if you don't have a 10-inch. Uh, uh, you don't have to butter it at all except maybe the sides, not the bottom, because the pastry, so to speak, is is pretty buttery. So, in, in, in fact, it's a, it's a stick of butter. And you cut the butter into the other dry ingredients, which are two cups of flour and two cups of dark brown sugar. Uh, when I say cut, it's like exactly you are making pastry. Uh, I have a pastry blender, which you know is handled with like wires, that, and I like to use it, and it's a good one. Um, some of them are really chintzy, and the wires bend immediately, but mine been used for 25 years and it's still in good shape. But you could use two knives. Um, just take two table knives and holding one in each hand, uh, keep cutting, the, literally cutting the butter into the flour and sugar mixture. So half of that, well, two and a half cups of that, measure it out, spread it evenly into the bottom of your pan. If it's a nine-inch pan, this is going to be an awfully thick crust. So I really do recommend a 10-inch pan, a spring form, like you use for a cheesecake. But if you have a 9-inch pan, um, maybe you hold back a half a cup. Two, use two cups of the mixture for the bottom. And then the top gets the spices, which are inordinate. <laughs> it sounds like way too much, but it's not. Four teaspoons a freshly grated nutmeg. My friend who was eating this cake uh, said, well, does it have to be freshly grated, and how do you grate nutmeg? There are a lot of ways to grate nutmeg, and I, if I had the energy at that moment, I would have gone into my closet, and the top is a box with a collection of nutmeg graters. There are all different ways to grate nutmeg. Uh, but if you have a microplane, that works. Um, the fine side of a box grater works. I have a grinder. Um, you actually put the, the the nutmeg into this gizmo. It's like a pepper mill, 
and, but it doesn't have a mill at the bottom. It, it has claws that hold the, the actual nutmeg in place, and then it shaves off uh, the nutmeg. I like this one. And then it also looks nice on the shelf. So four teaspoons of freshly grated nutmeg, one teaspoon of ground cinnamon, and a quarter teaspoon of ground cloves. Don't worry about the cloves. They're minimal but necessary. Um, and if you don't have ground cloves, leave it out. Uh, so they're not so necessary. And you mix all that up. This is now the top of the cake. And into that, you, beat, you, you stir, um, beaten together, a cup of yogurt and an egg. Beat them together in a little cup. Add them to the dry ingredients um, with one teaspoon of baking soda. As you're stirring it in the yogurt, sprinkle that on top and stir it thoroughly in. Pour it into your uh, springform pan and sprinkle on a half a cup of coarsely chopped walnuts. I, I, I read one of these Armenian recipes this morning. And it called for pistachios. And now that you can buy shelled pistachios, I think I'm going to, and I have some, I'm going to, I think I'm going to try that next time. And there will be a next time. I love this cake. I've been making it for many years. And, of course, I always think of Lori um, and the tragedy. Um, anyway, and, and you can, as I say, it's online. My version of it is online uh, and other versions. of are, uh, And I might even try one of the other versions uh, because I don't always have, by the way, do not use Greek yogurt in this. You have to use plain, normal, whole milk yogurt. So this brings me not uh, to food prices. I don't know, nobody makes a, a thing of this on, on TV, on news, which I'm addicted to, or on radio news, which I also listen to. But inflation is largely generated this time around by increases in, of course, gasoline at the pumps, which everybody notices, and food prices, which, of course, everybody notices. But those two are, in fact, the main generators of the 6.8% inflation that was announced last Friday. And food is way higher than that. Uh, I think, and interestingly, food eaten at home, which I think is almost 10%, higher than it was last year, um, uh, is, is largely generated by meat prices. So if you are doing a meatless day or two of your week, you probably may not have noticed your overall food budget has gone up. Well, yes, fruit and vegetables, you know, since I'm a big fruit and vegetable eater, uh, I, I noticed that too. But, sir, but, you know, if you stay seasonal... It, it, it's not that bad. It really isn't. Um, and meat prices are what's terrifying. So the cheapest meats, uh, and by the way, the, the biggest increases have been in beef, way more than pork, which is more than chicken. So if you're a chicken eater, uh, my, my nephew, for instance, hasn't eaten red meat in months, and he says he doesn't really notice He's spending much more on food. Uh, milk and eggs have gone up, yes, but you know, eggs are still still pretty inexpensive. Uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, I don't know. What do you pay for a dozen eggs, Marshall? You, are you conscious of it? Uh, you know, I because prices have been so crazy. No, I I, I just get what I need to get. And, yeah, uh, well, I as I, I did a whole thing on this a, a couple of years ago. There are too many choices in eggs. <laughs> if you go to any one of my markets, there are probably, I don't know, at least five or six different kinds of large eggs, uh, cage-free, brown, organic, I don't know. You know there, and the prices vary from two ninety nine a dozen, which I think is a very fair price for a dozen of uh, power, protein powerhouses like eggs, uh, and, you know, we're not afraid of eggs anymore. I'm old enough to remember when there was a time people were afraid of eggs. Thank God we're not afraid of eggs anymore. Anyway, and if you're on a budget, really, eggs are a savior. And even at three ninety nine a dozen, 
What is twelve into three ninety nine? Is that it's not even three, it's thirty cents, thirty something cents an egg. Um, so if you eliminate beef, you've, you're ahead, and pork, you're ahead. However, there are cuts that are still very affordable. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that because. I went to. I actually was went to the butcher to buy a back chicken backs to make chicken broth, and didn't have them that day. And since I was already eager to make broths, I, I bought all these um, uh, neck bones, and I boiled them uh, for six hours to make what we call these days bone broth. You know, a, a high collagen, high protein, uh, gelled broth, and. After six hours of simmering, the meat was still delicious. So I, of course, stripped the meat off the bones and did something with the meat. And thinking to myself, well, this is really good meat that I haven't eaten since I don't know when. My mother always sent me to the butcher for neck and tenderloin. In those days, tenderloin meant what we call hanger steak now. Those are two very flavorful cuts. So for ground meat, the, the kosher butcher, anyway, sold it for ground meat. Anyway, I, I, I decided this week to cook um, the neck meat as uh, a braise, basically. And uh, I, 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 I made this for some Mormon family as a cultural experience. I made a whole Jewish dinner while well, lunch and and with, for me, some key dishes, including what I would call gedemte fleisch. Now, I didn't grow up with my grandmother, who was very American, uh, uh, calling it gedemte fleisch. She would call it potted beef, potted meat, potted flanken. We would eat flanken. So I go to the butcher to buy flanken, and Bob's favorite way of my potting flanken is sweet and sour. So, But I couldn't find good flanken, and even the bad flanken was so crazy expensive that I said, this is a poor man dish. I'm not going to make this with $15 a pound uh, 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 meat. So I bought the beef neck bones instead, and I potted them. Boy, was that good. I will do that again. And I, it took, uh, I would say, a good three hours of simmering. And I, by the way, I have... This is a recipe that is in my book, Jewish Home Cooking, but for sweet and sour flunkin'. Um, but I, am, I have revised the recipe because that recipe called for canned tomato sauce, which is, of course, what any uh, Jewish grandma would have used in the 1950s. So I am now updated it, and I used, instead of canned tomato sauce, I used bottled tomato puree, Italian bottled tomato puree. Uh, I buy a very good brand. Uh, the Muti I see is around now, M-U-T-I. I see the supermarkets carry that now. That's a very good brand, too. Uh, but I buy a good brand. It's a nice, thick uh, tomato puree. And what I did was, I instead of, I didn't want to stand and brown this meat, which is what I did in Jewish home cooking, I put all my neck bones in a roasting pan, and I roasted them at 450 degrees for about 35, 40 minutes, flipping them once, about 20 minutes in. And they got nice and brown. Uh, I put them into my uh, casserole pot, top of the stove casserole, although I actually was intending to put it in the oven, which I, I, I do frequently with these kind of things, which I still would do, except the oven had something else in it, and I didn't want, don't want to go into that. But anyway, I did it on top of the stove. Um, so I put it into the pot, a big cast iron enamel pot, and I poured in the tomato uh, 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 puree. I rinse out the bottle with about, let's say, a quarter of the bottle of water, and then I also put into the roasting pan that I used to roast the meat, I also put in about a cup or so of water, and I swish that around. I even put the flame under the pan for a minute or two uh, to really get up any of the brown bits that were, and the, and the fond, I love that word, the French call it fond, F-O-N-D, the fond from the bottom of the pan. 
and poured that into the casserole. And my, it, I did not have enough liquid to cover the casserole. Well, that was okay. Um, and I simmered the meat, flipping it around a few times, adding water a little bit at a time because it, it does uh, simmer down. By the way, I did this covered even, uh, or a semi-covered. I had a little top, a little bit of jar on a very slow simmer for about three hours. And at that point, the meat was not totally, totally, totally tender, but it was coming away from the bones. So I let it come to uh, room temperature, and then I stripped the meat off the bones, discarded the bones. Actually, I rinsed the bones because they had so much flavor clinging to them, and I put that back in the pot, that liquid um, from rinsed bones, and I put the meat in there with the sauce, and I continued to, when I was ready to serve it, I continued to cook it, reheat it, for mm, at least another half hour until the meat was really melting your mouth tender. It really is very good meat. And it, 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 amazingly, it really keeps its flavor, even with all that, that cooking. And it has a lot of collagen, So, and you've, and you've cooked the, the sauce with, with the beef bones, too. So you really get a very, very velvety, silky, sweet and sour. Oh, so the sweet and sour part, I didn't even tell you. This is totally my grandmother, Elsie. Um, she made sweet and sour dishes. She was from Brooklyn, but her parents were from Belarus, what we now call Belarus. Um, anyway, I used for that 24-ounce bottle of tomato puree and four pounds of neck bones, I used about three tablespoons of brown sugar and a half teaspoon plus a tiny pinch more of, uh, of citric acid crystals, otherwise known as sour salt. And this was the souring agent that Eastern Europeans used because, of course, in those days, we're talking about into the 19th, beginning of the 20th century in Eastern Europe, a lemon, which is what we would use for as a souring agent, was a rare and expensive thing. So what you had was citric acid crystals, which, by the way, were very handy for making pickles as well, keep them crisp. So I, I, many years ago, I have to look this, it would be the early 1990s, so it's a long time ago already, uh, I wrote a book called Soup Suppers. You remember, this is my best-selling book, Marshall. I would, ima- I would uh, imagine it would be, It's yeah. still in print after all of these years. And I oft- people often tell me, I think, I think even Jill has told me that it's her favorite cookbook. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, but for doing a, a cl- a cooking classes revolving around that book, um, one of the things I made was my grandmother's uh, sweet and sour cabbage soup, which is tomato-based. All, it has lots of tomatoes. You put it, flanken, of course, you put it in as a soup meat, meaning you just cook it along with everything else so to flavor the broth. You know, in those days, you didn't make broth and then make soup. You made soup. <laughs> if you wanted to have meat flavor, you put in some meat. If you wanted to have some chicken flavor, you put in some chicken. But you didn't separately make broth. So, uh, and, and certainly there was no box broth around. In any case, um, in order to do that, I, I, I bought a large quantity of sour uh, crystals. Now, I'm afraid to say it's a lifetime supply. Huh. Uh, during that book promotion period, I, was, uh, I gave away tons of it. Every uh, class I would do, I would give them a packet with enough... Uh, sour salt, and I forget what else, to make uh, my grandmother's uh, sweet and sour cabbage soup. And um, I still have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so and it, and as you see, to make a, a, a big pot of sweet and sour gedempte uh, fleisch, which gedempte means overcooked or well-cooked, depending on how you look at it <laughs> and what it is. Because like in the case of neck meat, it's hard to overcook it, but it is definitely well-cooked. On the other hand, if you 
in a, in a kosher home where they where where the the cook let's not be race sexist here <laughs> where the cook usually a woman uh, where the cook was given the impression that she was not allowed to serve rare meat she would make a gedempta steak which you did not want to eat so gedempta means uh, it's funny because last night I was watching an old movie ni- early 1950s uh, it's called The Seven Little Foys I don't know if you ever saw this it's a, it's a Bob Hope vehicle and I must say Bob Hope is amazing uh, he was an amazing dancer, singer everything amazing I gotta say but it was very funny because it's about an Irish family, the Foys. <laughs> but they were in New York. So when his agent, who's obviously Jewish and makes a few, uh, drops a few hints that he is, says to, uh, to, to Eddie Foy, uh, you know, if you get that job, I'll take you out for some Gedem de Brust. What does that mean? It means oh, um, potted flanken. <laughs> Brust flanken is a kind of. It, it, there are several cuts of flanken. Flanken, by the way, is short ribs. So, of course, short ribs are now very, very popular. So flanken has gotten very expensive. And there are other meats like that, too. So some of your go, used-to-be go-to inexpensive meat cuts are no longer inexpensive because they're so popular now. For instance, skirt steak. Romani- uh, uh, Jews used to call it Romanian tenderloin. We didn't call, or skirt steak. We never called it fajitas. But when fajitas became popular, so did the price of skirt steak go up. Uh, short ribs, the same thing. Um, I told you, flanken is nothing but short ribs cut in the opposite direction. Hanger steak is another one. Used to be a cheap cut. If you went to a Paris bistro, really in the old days, that's what you got. Longley, they called it. And my mother used to have it ground for chopped meat. Uh, so the tastes cha- – here's one. The biggest price increase of the last year has been on bacon. And, of course, bacon is an American comfort food. Uh, I think there's even a book called Nobody Doesn't Love Bacon. So, uh, you know, except unless you're kosher or, <laughs> or, or Muslim <laughs> uh, and you eat halal. Um, anyway, yeah, the biggest price increase has been on bacon, and of course, you never could, you know, if you if you bought, uh, a, you know, this uh, uh, the the breast bacon, it was always just as bacon. Now you can buy it as meat, and it's like fifteen dollars a pound. It's crazy, the fat. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe there are more people on keto diet than. <laughs> than even admit to it because, you know, the first thing, if, if I tell somebody I'm eating ketogenically, they say, oh, what do you eat, bacon all day? I mean, really, that's the impression of the of the uh, low to almost no-carb diet is that all you can eat is bacon. But, uh, yes, you can eat bacon on <laughs> this diet. What a diet. And it, we do. <laughs> what a diet. Bacon <laughs> and eggs. Yeah. Now, bacon and eggs. So the eggs part is so cheap. The bacon, like a, a pound of bacon, I don't know what a whole pound of bacon costs, but maybe it could be 12 or $15. I mean, I see the packages of bacon in the supermarket are $8, and they're not a full pound. So there you go. All right. All yeah. right. Become vegetarian, and you can still eat for a reasonable price. Or else just don't look at the prices and and put it on a well, uh, put it you on know, a charge account. Well, have to, Marshall. I know, I know. It's it's tough. Me, it's an old habit. Yeah. I don't have to so much now. I don't really. I don't have to, but that doesn't mean I'm not interested. Um, but I do. I, I, I am. You know, I don't want to pay thirty five dollars a pound for uh, uh, for filet mignon, or even twenty four dollars a pound for a good steak, uh, unless I'm in a, and I will pay it in a restaurant. Interestingly. Because then somebody's serving me and they're cooking it at a thousand degrees. Okay. All right. Time for, time for another cup of coffee. <laughs> and bacon and, and some bacon. And that pri- <laughs> and the price of coffee has gone up too, but not nearly as much as beef. <laughs> All right, Arthur. We'll okay, speak, take care. Take Everybody care. have a great week. It's right, warm we'll, this week. All right, we'll speak to you next week, Arthur. Arthur Schwartz, the food maven here on 
Robin Hood Radio. Uh, of course, you can hear Arthur every Monday morning, and we rebroadcast Arthur also on the weekends as well. Providing support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, Hillsdale Home Chef. More information, 518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com.